All right, we are back today with another writing activity. And this one we're going to talk about psychic distance. So psychic distance is the third tool that we're going to add into our toolbox for writing. Uh, it goes alongside pacing and some sensory detail writing, along with grammar, word choice, and all those other things that we can use. This is a very important tool for more advanced writing. But it can also help a lot with some of the basics, like just understanding how to stretch out a piece to make it longer, to make it hit with more emotion. So it's one of the most difficult elements of writing because it's one of those things that it's really hard for us to understand within ourselves. We know what it is that we mean to see. Our job is to convince others to see it the same way that we're trying to portray it. And so practicing psychic distance can go a long way towards that. But it takes a little bit of work. It's more, as they say, art than science in order to really get a good feel for it. So we're going to practice it today so that we understand the basics. And it's one of those things that we want to keep practicing in order to get better at. Psychic distance is a skill that combines the knowledge of pacing with the ability to include sensory details to change the amount of information that's given to a reader. In short, psychic distance is simply the distance that the author keeps the reader from the action. And this can be done for a variety of reasons, kind of like with pacing. Um, it can reflect the emotive state. It can reflect what's important or what's not important. And there's a whole bunch of different reasons that we might change the psychic distance. Maybe something's happening within the story and we want to add some dramatic irony, so we want to prevent our readers from knowing the full story so that we can throw a twist on them at the end or something like that. One of the things that I like to think about, because oftentimes we use our frames of reference to understand things, we use our knowledge um, of the things that are around us and that we've experienced, especially visually, to kind of connect with ideas. So this is one of those. If we think about, say, old video games, right, it started out very old, uh, very removed, things like asteroids or uh, snake or pong or something where you're not really in the action you're kind of observing it from afar as things are going on so in that instance we don't add a whole lot of detail you know the asteroids and asteroids don't look particularly asteroid like the um spaceship is just a little triangle um and when we get to things like mario he's kind of a little guy that just jumps around on the screen and does things we don't see things from his perspective we're not really close we can't see what he's looking at we can just kind of see things in a very general panoramic kind of sense so that's far psychic distance where you don't put a whole lot of detail you just kind of explain what's there and that's it but then as you get in closer you get more and more detail and you have to start parsing out what's important what do i need to focus on what's interesting uh, why am I seeing this? Is there, is there something that I can't see? And is there a reason why I can't see it? So as we come in closer and we add to that psychic distance, it changes the way that we understand the world that we're trying to navigate with. The same thing happens with movies. If you want a big dramatic movie, they don't always, they don't necessarily hold you at an arm's length unless that's what the, the director and cinematographers are going for. You know, but they also don't shove things right in your face unless they're trying to either focus on something as important or to elicit some feeling of, of uncomfortableness or, you know, or, or general emotional response or something like that. So psychic distance is a tool that's used all over the place, not just in writing. But how do we do it in writing? I mean, we talked about it in video games. We talked about it in movies. How does it work with writing? Well, let's look at some examples and then talk about what it is that you are going to need to do. So for, an, for examples, let's take first an object. We'll look at an event here in a little bit, but there's a little bit more that gets involved in that. So let's just look at something very simple, an object, which is a stick. So we start off with far psychic distance. So there was a stick lying on the ground. Okay, Very simple, uh, my, kind of a minor throwaway thing that you might just add in to give texture to a seam. Not really important. There's a stick over there. There's some mountains in the background. The fluffy clouds are overhead. Nothing really important about that. Just kind of a minor detail we're adding in. But what if the stick is more important than that? So let's focus on it a little bit. On the ground lay a small twig that had fallen from the stout oak growing near the concrete patio. Okay, so as you can see, we're slowing the pacing down, 
we're focusing a little bit more on this particular twig. It's not just a throwaway detail, but there's something about it that we're, we're adding in. Maybe it's because we're trying to slow down the scene or maybe we're setting up for some sort of emotional reveal or any number of things. We want to, we want to show that the character that we're talking about is looking at this exact stick. Something is important here. Let's get even closer. On the ground, lying solitary, was a small wooden branch, its leaves just turning from green to autumnal gold, cast from the towering oak growing just off the old concrete patio behind Martin's childhood home. All right, so now we're getting more sensory details. We're talking about the coloring. We're talking about the location. Why is it important? Uh, maybe it has something to do with the childhood home. Is there a reason why it's important this stick is sitting by itself? You know, any number of questions that we could ask, just like we had to do with the pacing writing, except here we're focusing on an object. We're focusing in on what is going on in the character's head. They're noticing this, and it's important to them. And then we're going to get into something that is extremely close. So this is where we really crank up the detail and try to pull out an emotional response for whatever reason it is that we're going for. So the cracked concrete patio was largely bare with the sole exception of a small oak branch, its green and gold leaves still wet with morning dew. It reminded Martin of his childhood using sticks found from that mighty oak to fight off swaths of imaginary pirates or bringing phantasmal bank robbers to the Old West Jail, where he was the diminutive sheriff. He'd grown since then, but the vestiges of our childhoods are never fully shed, and he turned it over with the toe of his worn work boot, sending a single ant scurrying for cover. In his mind, it would make the perfect weapon for slaying a dragon as a gallant knight and he longed to be taken back to days where the scariest bits of reality were imaginative. So now we're really focusing on the psychic distance. Our main character didn't say anything. He didn't even so much as think something directly. It just focuses on what it was that he was looking at it and why is that important. We could have added even more detail and talked about the ways in which it twisted and the ways in which it branched out in different places and uh, write very James Fenmore Cooper-ish uh, if we wanted to and you know not use one word if we could find a dozen instead. But that's not really our point here. Our point isn't to drag out a story and give you every little detail, but it's mostly just to focus on why is something important and how do we show that to the reader. So we have this skill, changing our psychic distance, changing our focus. Now let's look and see what happens when we add this to an action sequence. So this is something that's similar to what we did with the pacing writing, but it's a little bit different in that where our purposes are going to be different. So let's take a, an exciting action. Let's take a car crash. So far, Karen crashed her car into a light pole. Very simple, something that, you know, if you were driving down the street and you saw happening, you might take note, maybe, you know, slow down, make sure everybody's okay. Um, but you, you don't have any vested interest in it other than the fact that it's an unfortunate accident. Um, you know, you don't, you don't have any strong connection to it, and it just kind of happened. We have in the middle that Karen swerved around the minivan, her tires failing to catch on the slick pavement, sending her into the light pole that flanked the street. Okay, so a little bit more detail, a little bit more um, information. Uh, we don't know a whole lot about the scene still, um, but we do know what kind of led into this and was it entirely her fault. Well, now we're focusing on we have questions to ask and things to think about. So let's get into close. The rain beat down on the windshield of Karen's new Lexus, a gift from her husband on their 10th anniversary. Suddenly, a peal of lightning revealed a gray minivan obscured by the driving precipitation, which hydroplaned across the yellow line that separated the two halves of Washington Avenue. Twisting her steering wheel purely out of preservation, Karen barreled into one of the black metal light poles that straddled both sides of the road. Okay. So, again, more and more detail. We're kind of getting that idea based on the weather and based on the fact that, uh, you know, it wasn't just not paying attention, doing merging incorrectly, but there was an actual emergency, kind of getting the feeling based on the psychic distance of what's going through Karen's mind. And we get in extremely close. We're going to add in even more detail, try to get even more information to, to catch our readers' attentions here. 
The storm swirled overhead, a vicious nor'easter whose rain blocked vision beyond the few feet of penetration afforded by the headlights of Karen's new Lexus. The car had been given to her from her husband, Jacob, on their tenth anniversary of their wedding. Ten long, horrible years of lies and infidelity that the car hardly took the sting out of. Karen's windshield wipers worked feverishly to try to clear the screen of water, and suddenly a flash of lightning illuminated the sky, showing a grayscale scene of flooded roads and a hydroplaning minivan filled with screaming children and a terrified mother sliding into Karen's lane. In a panic, Karen jerked the wheel to one side, sending her Lexus careening over the curb before smashing into the steel street lamps just off the rows of tiny tourist shops in the small New England town. The windshield spiderweb before exploding, along with the airbags, which, had she been wearing her seatbelt, would have saved Karen's life. All right, so here we have a scene with a lot of detail in it. We could go into even more and talk about the color of the car and all sorts of things and all the different screens and dials and things on the dashboard and really kind of show how expensive this car is if we wanted to focus more on that. But instead, our focus is going to be more on the weather and the events that are happening. So with our psychic distance, unless we want to really stretch this out, we're just going to focus on that. So the object in this can still be that car, but now it's the impetus for something happening instead of just uh, being something that happens to be there. Okay? So now we have these ideas. We have our kind of our basic understanding of psychic distance. Let's move on to our activity. So what we're going to do today is that you're going to get into pairs with a partner. Each of you are going to draw an object special to you without giving any other explanation. Now, you don't have to be an artist for this. In fact, this is one of those things where if you're not a good artist, it actually works better for you because it leaves your partner kind of open to interpretation with whatever they get. You don't want to deliberately make something so obscure that they have no idea, but you also don't want to hand it to them um, with a full explanation or even a title because you want them to grab this and then run off in whatever creative direction that they want. So you're going to swap drawings with your partner and then use the drawings that each of you receives to demonstrate the four levels of psychic distance. So you're going to pick this object and you're going to write your own example of psychic distance, either focusing on the object or focusing on some action that the object is directly involved in, like the car. With this assignment, this is going to be similar to the pacing. You're going to write different lengths, but you're going to use the same prompt. So far psychic distance uses one sentence. Medium is usually two to three sentences. If you want to do something that's more compound, then you can do it in a shorter length of time. You just want to make sure that you have enough detail to change it from being just something in the background to something that is an active object of focus. Close, where we're going to want to add in a little bit more. And then extremely close, where we get to two to three paragraphs. So all in all, this should not take you longer than a page. Um, realistically, if you get close to a page, you've probably done too much. Certainly no penalty for having done that. But uh, we don't want you to overdo it. This is just a skill that we're going to practice. Okay. We've talked about psychic distance and what it is that you need to do. Let's go ahead and end here, and we'll see you next time.